Welcome to the Mindset Mentor Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Dial, and I have a very special announcement for you. For the next 12 weeks, I'm going to be putting out a special series of the Mindset Mentor called the Expert Series. This is where I'll be sitting down with some of the biggest experts in the entire world, from scientists to psychologists to CEOs to authors to neurobiologists. And my hope is to extract some of the world's leading experts and the knowledge that they have in their head so that you can learn and grow. So yes, for the next 12 weeks, the Mindset Mentor comes comes out every single day, Monday through Friday. And our very first guest is Greg Braden, the New York Times bestselling author, researcher, educator, and lecturer. He's known as a pioneer for bringing modern science, ancient wisdom, and human potential all together. He's spoken in front of the United Nations, Fortune 500 companies, and the US military. This is an incredible interview where we dive into manifestation, affirmations, and the importance of our thoughts and our words, and the power of the human heart. Welcome, everybody, to the Mindset Mentor Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Dial, and I am so excited to be joined by Greg Braden. And uh, as you heard in the intro, Greg is uh, a scientist, New York Times bestselling author, has some amazing stuff on Gaia as well. Uh, but before we dive into that, uh, I would love to give people a little bit of a background about who you are, how you got into the field that you're in. And then from there, I've got some really interesting questions that they're going to open up my audience to things they've never thought of before. Um, but welcome to the show, Greg. Hey, Rob, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I just discovered we're, we're about neighbors. I'm just north of you and uh, uh, in the just outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico is where I'm, I'm filming from in the studio today. Love it. Yeah. So could you give us a little bit of an idea of, you know, how you became a scientist and then how your life has progressed over the past 30 to 40 years to, to get you? Uh, so you said you were going to give the background, but now you want me to give the background. I got it. <laughs> I want you. You, you yeah. lived it. So you know it better than I do, I'm sure. So, you know, I don't know how far back uh, you want to go. I, um, I was born and raised in a very uh, conservative community in the, the Midwest, in the state of Missouri, northern Missouri, a, a rural area. Uh, this big beautiful country of ours and uh, I was a scientist uh, before I ever went to college I was a scientist from the age of about four and uh, um, was just fascinated by the natural world and our relationship to it um, before I was in kindergarten my, my mom was very support she didn't understand me but she was supportive of me and she and I worked together. We memorized all of the names of the dinosaurs and the ages and the planets and the solar system and the pharaohs of Egypt. And, um, you know, I always, uh, I always felt that, that science is a, it's a relatively neutral language. Uh, it doesn't carry a lot of the baggage that religion or spirituality or politics certainly carry in conveying ideas and um uh, i knew at an early age okay i'm beating around the bush i'll just tell you can i just tell you the story please i love it so i i was also born into a very dysfunctional mm -hmm. alcoholic family Me too. Uh, we were connected well, on that i had an alcoholic father five five we were connected that way yeah, well <laughs> me as well he fortunately he left uh, when i was young but the, for me, my refuge in those difficult years uh, came in nature, mm -hmm. and hence uh, science, understanding the nature around me, and also in music. And I had an experience, uh, I'm going to kind of give away my age, this was in the late 1950s, 1960s. And I had an experience in the 1960s that really set the stage for where, where I am today and where we'll go today. I went to my first rock concert, uh, Jefferson Airplane, the original Jefferson Airplane. And what I saw, Rob, I'd never seen anything like this. I saw this group of people on a stage influence the way that in that, in that venue was about 30,000 people. So they influenced the way that those 30,000 people were feeling in their lives. That group of people had the ability to shift the emotion and the feeling inside of the people that were in that room. And I, I recognize that, but I also recognize that when the concert was over, when we left, we went outside, that feeling began to wane mm -hmm. very quickly. And the people needed something outside of themselves to, to create that feeling again. In that time, they were vinyl records and uh, cassette tapes. They needed to have something to respond to for them to have the experience. Well, in the same year, I also had the opportunity to see uh, another 
out, uh, it was an event in a stadium with about 70,000 seats and a speaker named Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. And it was a, it was a religious, uh, a religious oriented talk. And, and I have to say, honestly, I, I wasn't totally into to everything that was being said, but what I saw was a stadium of 70,000 people and they were being moved on a deep level by the words of one man on the pitcher's mound in this outdoor stadium. Uh, it was at the uh, at Kansas City Athletic Stadium, the A's Stadium in Kansas City, Missouri. But here's the difference. When we left, they did not need something outside of themselves to maintain that feeling because his words had changed the way they felt about themselves and their relationship to the cosmos, to God, to one another, to the earth, to their communities. And it stayed with them because they were changed in the presence of his words. Hmm. And I, I recognized both those at an early age. And I thought there's, there's got to be a way to combine these two, to the music and the sound. I'm still searching for that. But the, the science, the science gives us a reason to think differently about ourselves. And it's based on honest, truthful, factual information. Uh, if it's good science. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and from that, we begin to think of ourselves differently and we are changed in the presence of new understandings. It all comes down to our story. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about is our story. It doesn't have to be technical, uh, but this, our, our story, uh, our lives literally are based upon our story. We solve our problems. We choose our relationships. We heal our bodies. We choose our politics. We build our society all based upon the way we've been taught to think about ourselves and what's happening right now. And I think we all know this is our story is changing mm -hmm. and it, there is a battle, Rob, there's a battle for our story. There's a battle for our thoughts, for our beliefs. There's a battle for our very humanness that is unfolding and it's happening right in front of us. Many people don't recognize it because it is compartmentalized, but it is happening right now on, on the mainstream of the world stage. So I go back to those experiences as, as a scientist today through the eyes of what I now know. And I know that the, the most fundamental act, the most radical act uh, of empowerment that any of us can embrace is to honor the deep truth of our story. Not the story necessarily that we've been coerced into accepting or believing. Uh, not the story maybe that came from our family or our religion or our education, uh, you know, academia or our political affiliations, but the true story of our relationship with ourselves, with the world around us, with one another, with the past, with the future, with the cosmos, and if we believe uh, in, in a higher power, and in the presence of that story, we are changed. And that gives new significance to what's unfolding in our lives. It, it's a celebration that moves us from the fear uh, into the freedom of self-mastery. And the science is now telling us literally the self-regulation of our own biology. What could be more powerful than to be able to self-regulate, up-regulate and down-regulate genes to enhance your immune response on demand, to awaken longevity enzymes <clears throat> on demand, to create resilience to a changing world on demand, deep states of intuition and so much more. What could be more powerful than to awaken to that possibility now in the presence of a world that's changing faster than we can document it in our, our textbook? So it's a long answer to a short question, but the science for me uh, I recognized in early age that it was a, a language that would help me personally to understand my relationship to the world that I was drawn to and that comforted me in, uh, in times of extremes. And I think that's true for all of us today. Hey everybody, let me tell you about my favorite drink that I take first thing in the morning. It's called Athletic Greens. And here's how I start my day every day. I go to the bathroom, I brush my teeth, I drink Athletic Greens, and then I go meditate. And in 30 seconds, in just one scoop, I get 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients. And it has everything that a multivitamin does, but it's also got greens, probiotics, prebiotics, digestive enzymes, immunity formula, adaptogens, and so much more. And when COVID first hit, I ordered some for my my mom because I wanted to make sure that it kept her immune system up and 
I paid for it out of my own pocket. That's how important it was for me. So if you're looking to upgrade your multivitamin or take just one nutritional formula that's going to help you cover all of your daily nutritional bases, then you should consider Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is getting as much high quality nutrition into your diet as possible and makes it incredibly easy to do so without the need to buy multiple products. So make an investment in your health today and try the ultimate all-in-one wellness bundle and support your immunity, your gut health, and your energy by visiting athleticgreens.com slash dial. You'll receive a year supply of liquid vitamin D for free with your first purchase. That's athleticgreens.com slash dial. These days, it can be so hard to find the time to sit down and learn more. And it's not easy with the likes of social media that can be so addictive and so time consuming. So you may sit there and think, I don't have enough time to develop myself. But there's an app that I highly recommend. It's called Blinkist. Blinkist is for anyone who cares about learning, but doesn't have a whole lot of time. And Blinkist takes all of the key ideas and the insights from over 4,000 nonfiction bestsellers in more than 27 categories and puts them together into 15 minute text and audio audio explainers that helps you understand more about the core ideas of each book. And 15 million people are already currently using Blinkist to broaden their knowledge in 27 nonfiction categories, including self-help, personal growth, management, leadership, mindfulness, happiness, and so much more. And I like Blinkist because it's short, it's to the point, exactly like I am. And right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for my audience. If you go to Blinkist.com slash mindset, you can start your seven-day free trial offer and get 25% off of Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com slash mindset and get 25% off and a seven day free trial. Blinkist.com slash mindset. Yeah, I love it. There's there's three really big points that are in there that I want to dive into. The first one is is talking about the music and the experience because we were talking right before we started, you're a musician, I'm also a musician. I moved to Austin specifically because I thought I wanted to be a musician until I realized that what I do now fills that cup 100% for me as far as feeling like I'm doing something good in the world, but also at the same time being able to be really creative. One thing I wanna, I wanna, ask, your, wanna ask you about and that I've become very aware of as I've gone back and listened to the music I used to listen to in high school, it was a lot of music from the 70s, but it was also some Ben Harper in there. And it was never like anarchy type music, but it was always kind of like forget the system type music, right? And so I've realized that number one, I'm not good with having a boss. I can never have a boss. And I've never liked the system specifically. And I realized, oh my gosh, some of the music I was listening to actually created me to be who I am. And I've realized through through affirmations through everything I've done in in personal development over 16 years that music is just affirmations but a lot more it can actually be even I would say more powerful because you've got emotion that's attached to it and you've also got this constant singing it in the back of your head at all points in time versus just saying you know sitting down saying I am powerful I am powerful you could have a song stuck in your head for two hours so I'm curious with you as a musician and as a scientist what are your thoughts around affirmations and how they relate to music and how music uh, can actually change the person that we are based off the story we're telling ourselves in our heads. Yeah, well, those are those are three questions, Rob, and they're they're really good questions. When it when it comes to an affirmation, uh, affirmations can be powerful, mm-hmm. uh, and for some people, they're not. And a lot of people say, well, you know, if the if the the affirmation is so powerful, how come I'm not experiencing the effect? Mm-hmm. The what scientists tell us is the average human speaks to themselves consciously or unconsciously, we have thoughts spinning around in our brain about 60 to 80,000 thoughts per day. Some of those thoughts are the words to the songs and they are the affirmations. Uh, neuroscientist Andrew Newberg tells us, Newberg is his name, I'm sorry, in, um, in his work that, that a single word, a single word has the power to, to change the genes that creates stress or relieves stress in our lives. He's telling us that that something within us has the ability to shift to the very core of, of our expression. So we know that words are, are powerful. The key to a successful affirmation is that we must communicate with the subconscious part of our, of our mind, number one. Number two, we must communicate in the language that the subconscious recognizes. 
And this is where, uh, you know, you can say, I, I had a friend of mine when I was working in the corporations that had affirmations all over his office, all over his computer screen. They were on little post-it notes in the car we would carpool in. You know, my perfect mate is manifesting for me now. My perfect mate is manifesting for me now. That was his affirmation. And I said, do you say these things? He goes, oh man, I say them about a million times a day. I said, do they work for you? He says, nah, you know, these, these things don't work. And I said, well, why do you think they don't work? And he said, look at me. He says, I'm an engineer, I'm a slob. He said, I, I wear the same clothes to work three out of five days during the week, you know? And, and it, the, the bottom line, by the time he finished describing himself to me, even he didn't believe that he was worthy of his perfect mate manifesting for him now. So he was saying the words, but he was not, there was the, the uh, underlying emotion and what he was actually feeding into his, his system was counter to what those words were saying. So it's, it's not enough to say the words. When we go into our most ancient and cherished spiritual traditions, those words are what become the prayers. And for many people, I have, and I know you've heard this as well, a lot of people feel that prayer is broken, that the world doesn't work today the way it worked in biblical times, that we have lost our power and that we have no ability to communicate with uh, a greater power, with God, with the, the forces around us. Uh, and it's largely because the secrets, the deep truth of our relationship, the fundamental physics of our relationship to our world uh, have been minced and parceled and in many cases deleted from the texts, leaving us with a, a sense that we are essentially powerless beings. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you are powerless, then you are a victim. And if you're a victim, you need a savior. And that savior is coming to us on a silver plate in terms of technology, in terms of political leaders. I will save you if you just do these things. And this is why I say I think one of the most, the most powerful acts and the most radical act we can do is to think for ourselves uh, original thinking based upon the deep truth of our relationship to our bodies in the earth, not based upon the false assumptions of obsolete science that permeate our academic world right now. It's one of the reasons I left academia. It's one of the reasons many of my colleagues who are in this genre, who are very well-respected scientists, have left academia because they were not allowed to share with students and in their writings and their papers what they had found in their research that reflects a, a very different reality. Now, for me, it's, it's, a, uh, it's good news. It's a beautiful message of hope and possibility uh, as a sovereign biological being for a system that's based on centralized power and control it's probably the worst news they, they could imagine yeah. because it means we don't need the centralized power and control i, I think yeah. ultimately we're all better off by embracing our own power uh, because it frees us from the fear of a changing world and we all know our world my world is changing your world is changing uh boy is it ever <laughs> yeah. faster than we can document it in, in our classrooms and textbooks but the change isn't necessarily bad uh, until we compare it to what we've known in the past. And this is where the fear comes in. So the, the new discoveries helping us to understand we are part of rather than separate from our world. And this is, this is where the affirmations come in. So in, um, I was at the CERN Superconducting Super Collider in Geneva, Switzerland, where the, the physics experiments that are revealing what happened moments after our universe began. They recreate the, the beginning of our universe and then they're able to document what happened then to create the laws of physics that we are experiencing, that we're living under right now. And what they announced in 2012 is that there is in fact a field, an intelligent field of energy, it's a subtle energy that underlies all of creation. Um, before then, it was a metaphor, or a lot of people felt like it was a new age concept. You know, we are all one, everything mm -hmm. is, is connected. Or an indigenous, you know, a lot of indigenous elders talk about this. But here's, here's where they got stuck. And I've gone to scientific conferences where they'll, they'll take their hands and they'll say, oh yeah, there's, 
That's, that's no longer controversial. There is a field. There's a field out there that connects all things, and their hands go like this. Mm. There's a field out there that connects all things because subconsciously they're still saying we're separate from that field. Right. But here's what the science is showing us, and this, this was a game changer for me, uh, just a mind blower, that every atom in every molecule and every cell of our bodies in this very instant, so it's not like it's about to happen, it's, it's happening right now, every atom is constantly emerging and collapsing into that field. And what that says to us is that we are the field. It's not the fields out there. We literally are wrinkles. We are disturbances in this field. This, this body that is held in place by a conscious awareness as long as I'm breathing on this earth. Uh, I am a disturbance. I'm a, I'm a localized wrinkle in that field. And what that means is that if I want to bring about change in my world, I don't have to force a change out there. I become that change. Mm -hmm. And as I have become that change, the field is now reflecting what it is because I'm part of the field. Mm -hmm. So it's a subtle, but it's a very powerful way, very different way of thinking. You're not, you're not imposing change on the world around you. You are becoming the change. So you're becoming the abundance. You're becoming... Uh, the love, the gratitude, the care, uh, the healing. You're becoming those things, and that is very different. We're conditioned to ask for them, mm -hmm. to plead for them, because we're led to feel powerless in our lives when, in fact, there are modalities of ancient prayer that were edited from the, the religious texts in the fourth century by the church. They took they took out the information, helping us to understand that this, this deep relationship, leaving us powerless. And, and affirmations are essentially a, a, a form of prayer, or prayer is a form of affirmation, however you, you want to look at it, where we are communicating. And I want to be really clear, it's not about control, it's not about manipulation, it's not about imposing our will, it's about participating in the way that this field unfolds and expresses in, in our lives. And when you really begin to get that shift, it's, it's subtle and it's powerful. It's not making something happen out there. Mm -hmm. And that means you can't blame what's out there for your experiences. I, I come from a very dysfunctional, broken family, and I had to make a choice early in life as to whether or not I would, and, and community, uh, as to whether or not I would allow that to define my, my experience to define my existence. Uh, other people around me had the same experience and they made very different choices. They, uh, today, continue to blame uh, their environment, their parents, their family, their upbringing for the sad and unfortunate things in their lives. And, and that's a path. Mm -hmm. It's not right, wrong, good or bad. But we have a choice to make another path. And when we begin as a scientist, beginning to understand these relationships gave me the reason to think differently. Uh, and it also gave me the reason to test in my life if those thoughts are really true or not, what works and what doesn't. And you know, the, thing, the things that don't work, stop doing them. Quit putting the energy into them. And if, if the stuff works, you know, figure out how to, how to do even more of it. So, so I'm answering a couple of different questions. Uh, it's a long answer to a short question, but no, I wanted perfect. to like, well, I wanted to lay out that foundation so we can tie into it a little this bit. Is, this is perfect. So originally, so it goes back to what I love about it is there's, we're talking about science here. We're also talking about ancient wisdom that's thousands of years old, right? So one thing that you brought in was, was basically Gandhi's quote of be the change you want to see in the world. And Bruce Lipton, who I know your colleagues with and good friends with, and his book, The Biology of Belief, says if you look at yourself in the mirror, I'm not seeing Rob Dial. I'm seeing a collection of 70 trillion cells that listen to one central voice, and that central, they will do what I tell them to do. You know, so if I think to myself, oh, I'm sick, I'm sick, or I'm fearful, I will probably create that in my reality. Or if I think I'm healthy, I'm healed, or I'm manifesting whatever it is that I want to. And at a deep, deep level, not just saying it, but actually like the central voice believes every single bit of it in those 70 trillion cells then change the reality that's outside of me and I, I had this conversation two days ago with my girlfriend where um, i've always said it since since i started getting into personal development i tell my mom like i get whatever i want like i just do not in like a cocky way but like i just don't i don't actually believe that the opposite of what i want even exists 
And the reason why that's so powerful is because then I go and I get my, I create the reality that I want to because the other opposite of that reality doesn't even exist. And what you're saying is scientifically it's there. And for thousands of years, they've been talking about this as well, correct? Well, yes, yes, in, in general. So the way, uh, what the science strongly suggests now is that in this field that underlies all existence, the field that I'm emerging and collapsing from right now, mm -hmm. everything that I could ever imagine exists from the lightest of the light to the darkest of the dark, to the greatest ecstasy, ecstasy to the, 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 deepest, uh, the deepest hurt. It exists as a potential. And in physics, that potential is, is thought of as, as a, a scalar form of energy. It's, it means it, it, it exists as a potential, but it's not a realized uh, form of energy. It's, it's our relationship to this field and all of those moving potentials that gives us the ability to collapse the potentials into the scalar potentials into a vector reality. Okay, so that's, that's the, the words that describe the physics. We don't have to know that. What it says to us, it is our love or our fear of, of one of those potentials is what brings it breathe life in, into it so that it can become present in, in our lives. So this is very interesting because uh, a lot of people are afraid. They're afraid to think of, of bad things because they don't want to make it real. And thinking of it, this, we are such awesomely created beings. Uh, we are a, a highly advanced, technologically sophisticated, soft technology. We, rather than chips and wires and chemicals, we are neurons, ion potentials across cell walls, uh, blood and, and crystalline bone. And every cell, I'll just, just run through this real quick. Every cell, the, the average human body has between 50 and what you said, 70 trillion cells in the body. Each of those cells we are taught to think of is like these little soft, gushy, you know, kind of mushy bags of water that have some stuff in them. And that's one way of thinking. But what the science tells us, every one of our cells has about 0 0.07 volts of electrical potential. And you say, well, that's not very much. And I say, you're right until you do the math. 50 trillion times 0 0.07 volts. Uh, I'll just do the math. It's about 3.5 trillion volts of electrical potential. And you I, you know, people will listen to this, they'll write that down, you know, 3.5 trillion. What does that mean? If you all know what a 12 volt car battery looks like, or a, they now use them for our solar panels to store energy from the solar, a 12 volt battery. It, it is the equivalent, it, it would take three, a little over three billion 12 volt batteries lined up on, on a highway somewhere to equal the electrical potential in one human. Hmm. And it doesn't stop there because every one of those cells also has the characteristics of a transistor and of a resistor and of a capacitor. And what that means is that we massage the energy and the information that comes through our cells. Every cell stores and retrieves information just like we do on our, our computer chip. Every cell in our body is emitting photons of light and receiving photons of light. That is information that we interpret in our system, every cell in our body, the, the outside of the cells have receptors that literally are antenna that receive chemical signals. And we're hearing about that because of COVID, but they also receive subtle energy cells and electrical and magnetic, I'm sorry, subtle energy information and electrical and magnetic information. And it goes all the way down to the nucleus, the strands of the DNA or antenna. The genes are, are smaller portions of that antenna uh, you begin to see that all of the technology that we build in the world around us actually mimics what we already do in the cells of our body, except we do it better than the technology can ever do. And here's the key is that we self-regulate all of this inner technology through thoughts, feelings, emotions, beliefs, breath, focus, the core of our most ancient and cherished spiritual traditions and now the techniques 
that are being honed in the laboratories of the research institutions of, of the world. And this is what our, our programs are all about, helping people to, to change their story. This all changes our story and the way we've been taught to think. So when we begin to self-regulate this potential, it's everything I said, we have the ability literally on demand, consciously on demand, we can create a stronger immune system. Very well documented in the scientific literature. It doesn't take long to do it. Uh, it takes, uh, you know, minutes, literally in minutes, you can start uh, enhancing your SIGA immune response, first line response in, in the mouth. We awaken the longevity enzymes that stop the damage in the DNA, that heal the damage that's already recurred, and then begin to regenerate, rejuvenate, and rebuild those, uh, the strands of DNA and the telomeres on, on the ends of the DNA. We have access to deep states of intuition, and when that intuition is where our uh, affirmations come in, you don't have to go into a hypnotic trance from another person. We have the ability to access that subconscious on demand and so much more. And all of this changes the way we've been led to think about ourselves. And the science, I, I, you can't make this stuff up. Beautiful symmetry, the science is only now emerging precisely at the time when the systems that we have come to trust and respect in the past are buckling and collapsing around us. Social systems, economic systems, uh, <clears throat> the way that we uh, choose to live our, our lives on a daily basis, what we're finding is that localized living is the key. So localized forms of sources of food and energy and finance and resources, localized business. Uh, this is the way that, that we live uh, successfully in, in a time of extremes. And as we begin to assume and embrace uh, our mastery, of our soft inner technology, we are much more comfortable, much less fearful of letting go of the old centralized ways of living. It just makes sense to live locally. And you don't need science to tell you that. Our indigenous traditions have known, this, this is the beauty, Rob, you don't need the science. Uh, it doesn't have to be technical. The science helps us to understand the relationships. And then we can let that go and just implement these relationships in our lives. Did you know that monotasking is better for your mental performance than multitasking? Or that by simply cleaning your kitchen, you can reduce excessive snacking and listening to happier music can help you think more creatively? These are just a few of the fascinating things that I picked up while watching Outsmart Yourself, the brain-based strategies to a better you that's available on the Great Courses Plus. And not only am I learning something new, I'm learning something about myself, which is a great feeling and it's super, super empowering. And with the Great Courses Courses Plus. There's so many opportunities to learn and feed your curiosity about virtually anything. You can speak a new language, learn how to play chess, dive into the history of World War II, explore the universe, and so much more. And you get unlimited streaming access to hundreds of video and audio lectures from some of the most amazing people in the world, some of the best professors, some of the top experts in their fields. And the Great Courses Plus app, you can watch or listen on any device. And I want you to try out the Great Courses Plus for yourself. And I know you're going to love it. And right now, if you sign up for their quarterly plan, you get an extra month for free. Just visit my special URL by going to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash dial. Don't miss out on this. All you have to do is go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash dial right now. This episode is brought to you by Public Goods, the one-stop shop for sustainable, high-quality, everyday essentials made from clean ingredients and at affordable price. Everything from coffee to toilet paper to shampoo to pet food. Public Goods is your new everything store thoughtfully designed for the conscious consumer. Rather than buying from a bunch of single product brands, Public Goods members can buy all of their premium essentials in one place with one beautiful streamlined aesthetic. And the great thing about it is that you can find clean, healthy, eco products and innovative products on their website and their coffee is incredible I definitely recommend that and they ethically source and obsessively develop all of their products to be free from unhealthy ingredients and harmful additives that are still super common in drugstore and grocery store shelves and they're committed to making their products healthy and safe for humans animals and the environment 
and I worked out an awesome deal just for my listeners. You'll receive $15 off your first public goods order with no minimum purchase. That's right, they're so confident that you will absolutely love their products and come back again and again. They're willing to give you $15 to spend on your first purchase. Plus, right now, with your choice, you'll get either a free pack of bamboo straws or reusable food storage wraps with your order. You have literally nothing to lose. Just go to publicgoods.com slash dial or use the code dial at checkout. That's public goods, P-U-B-L-I-C-G-O-O-D-S dot com forward slash dial to receive $15 off your very first order. So, so there's, a lot, there's a lot of knowledge there. And now we're starting to get people to understand, hopefully, how powerful they actually are, how the science says it, but then also at the same time, how the ancient texts say it. So how do you take something like all of that knowledge that you just gave us and put it into an actual practice for people to, let's say, heal themselves as you brought up, or to actually start to change the reality to manifest whatever it is that they want in their future? It begins with the language. And the first part of the language, Rob, and, and in all, all honor and respect, is, is to remove it from a practice. Because when we talk about the practice, and I understand the intention of the question and, and why it was asked, uh, a practice leads us to believe it's something that we do uh, at some time in our day, in some special way we set a time aside for some kind of a practice. And what, what the science is telling us and what our, our ancestors have told us, it's not something we do, it's something we become. Mm. And that is a delicate conversation because it ties into culture and lifestyle and family and habits uh, and where our information comes from and what we've been led to believe and it's not for everyone you know we all the beauty is we all learn differently and we all learn at different different rates not everyone arrives at the same understanding in the same moment in time fortunately it's a good thing because if we all thought the same and we all embrace the same belief on the same day in the same moment in time and that was a wrong belief we'd be in trouble so the beauty of the diversity of our species is that we have different time horizons we have different learning curves and i think what we're learning is now to be kind to one another as we experience our individual learning curves and how we accept new ideas and new ways of living. And that's, that's up for everybody right now. A lot of change going on. We've all, we've all been through hell these last, uh, at least the last year for some people, even extending before that. How, this is where we get to test what we believe. How kind can we be as we express our concerns, as we express our differences, uh, and uh, points of view, number one. But number two, it's about what we become. How do we live our lives? And ultimately, this is, I think, what the whole COVID experience is boiling down to. It's all about love. Do we love ourselves enough to live our lives in a way that allows us to be the best version of ourselves? Do we love ourselves enough to live our lives in a way that supports our body in doing what our body knows how to do very well in the presence of a contagion. Science tells us we've been on this earth 200,000 years and for 200,000 years, the intelligence of this soft technology uh, has met the challenges that have come to our doorstep. You're not hearing that in the media. All you're hearing is there's something scary out there and we need technology to be able to survive and live. And that's the only story. Mm -hmm worked in the high-tech world but I think the missing piece <clears throat> is that we we are empowered and we do have a personal responsibility to make the choices in our lives so that our bodies are at their best and that's a difficult conversation because a lot of people don't want to and would prefer not to have that conversation would prefer just to say I want to live like I've always lived just give me whatever I have to have so that I can live like I've, I've always lived yeah My prayer is that we are all given the freedom to make those choices for ourselves rather than having those, those choices imposed upon us. And we all know what that means and what I'm talking about and where that's going. So uh, it remains to be seen where it's going to end. 
but it's yeah. this is a conversation that's up for everybody so so what's happening rob this is fascinating me we're taking topics that historically have been considered on the back burner they've been considered academic at best or philosophical and all of a sudden they are now front and center in our lives because literally not metaphorically literally our very survival depends upon our story and how we think about ourselves yeah i love what you said about you know coming out and just being in in love when there's so much fear that's out there i put up a uh video literally two or three days ago on my instagram because i was in a paint store i was getting paint because we were painting our garage right and i don't watch the news ever but they had the TV on and there was some news on the, the commercials and then there was a popular talk show. There were people that were talking and it was very blatant to me being on the outside looking in that this show was trying to push a specific agenda, right? So there's a couple sides. They were trying to push their side and it was, it was so much fear where I was like, I don't even feel good being inside of this paint store because I'm not used to this much fear being thrown at me. And it was only maybe three minutes. And I put up a video and I, and I had so much response to it where I said like, if you are paying attention, the news and the media seems to be brainwashing you in some sort of way to either go one side or another side. And the problem with that is that, you know, everybody wants something to change versus saying, hey, how can I actually be somebody who changes? If I want to see this change externally, I should be this change internally first. And what I said was, you know, you've got to be very careful. There's a war for your mind that's basically going on. And the reason why is because if you, the easiest way to conquer or, to, you know, to, to get past and control of humanity is to divide, right? That's, you know, it's the very easy part of war. If you've ever read any books on war, right? Divide them and that's the easiest way to conquer them. And so if you say, oh, you have the left, you have the right, you have this colored person, that colored person, you have this sex, that sex. And it seems to be that what's going on right now is that, is that they're putting sides against each other. When in reality, if someone takes a step back, they go, okay, if I live that person's life, I might believe the same things that they believe, right? And it doesn't make them wrong. It doesn't make me right. It doesn't make me wrong. It doesn't make them right. But can I look at them and say, I don't necessarily understand their, their point of view, but I can still love them through it. Because if anything, if we're going to survive this, what we need to be is in a place of love and not a place of fear because fear will also downregulate our immune system and that makes us even unhealthier, right? So you can see the divide happening right in front of you. Yeah, the idea of love means means different things to to different people, and yeah. that's where the answer is yes. You know, we we do do need to have that, and this is uh, this is why I say even before COVID, this was happening. We, as a society, and in some cases as a planet, as a as a global society, we were already primed for the fear. Mm. Are part of a very dangerous game. Uh, and an ancient trap where we are taught to hate and fear the things that prevent uh, the world from moving in one direction or another. So we had the, the 1% and the 99% and the inequities and that taught people to hate prosperity and, and wealth. And we have men against women and we've got Muslims against Christians and Jews against Muslims and we've got blacks against whites and Hispanics against whites and Asians against whites. Uh, and if you look back, if you step back and look, it's about every six months or so, you know, there's a new division that mm -hmm. is introduced and it's supported in, in the mainstream. And I'm not saying that there aren't problems. We've got a lot of problems, but we've always been able to work those problems out in our societies and our communities. But when people are influenced <clears throat> through through media and and there is a lot of influence i remember when i was a kid you know when i went to that jefferson airplane concert back in the old days we had like three television stations uh and they were actually news abc cbs and nbc and they were news stations and the the broadcasters would as objectively as they could they would inform us mm -hmm. as to what had happened without showing any uh any emotion they tried not to or or showing any favoritism in one way or another and i remember the exception i remember when walter cronkite 
I was in school, I was in grade school when Walter Cronkite announced the assassination of, of John F. Kennedy. And they, they let schools out and we all went home and watched in horror the events that were unfolding. And it's the first time I'd seen a news broadcaster cry. He cried, he took off his glasses and he, he held his hands in his eyes and he, he cried, which was very atypical for a news broadcaster. And we've come so far from that. We don't get news anymore. What we have are opinions. Uh, and the opinions are, uh, are for whatever reasons, they are uh, dividing us as, as a nation. But it goes so deep. It's actually dividing us, uh, the very fabric of our families. It's tearing our families apart. I, I know right now I have friends who have, I've never had any children, I've never been blessed with children. I think I'd be a good dad, it just never happened. Uh, but I have friends that are. And even at the dinner table with their kids in high school and college who get their information from one source in social media and the parents are getting their information from another source, it's very, very different information and it clashes so much at the dinner table, some of them cannot even complete the meal. There's so much hurt and so much anger. And what you're saying, Rob, is historically, it's a very old game. Uh, and it's being used now because it works. <clears throat> when you can keep people, a population divided, there is no, um, <clears throat> you, it's, it's hard to have common shared values and common shared opinions. And this is what's happening to America right now. The very fabric of, of America is the family, the family unit, values, uh, the history, the culture is all under attack. <clears throat> and as we give in to that division, what happens is uh, our society becomes ripe for a new way of thinking and a new way of living to sweep in and it happens before you know it. So is it right, wrong, good or bad? I'm not gonna say that here. I'm saying it's important that we be aware and not fall into the dangerous game that's dividing us from our friends, our families, our communities, our society, dividing us between nations. Because at the end of the day, we're just people. And at the end of the day, we all want to, we, we've heard this, we all want the same things for ourselves and for our children. Uh, and we, we have a pretty good idea of what that is. So it is, it's an awareness. And I think the most fundamental, the most radical act that any of us could do is to do what you've done. Turn off the external noise, that distortion, and, and think for ourselves. And you look around and, and ask yourself, is, are these things really happening? And if they are, make changes where changes need to be made, but do it from a place of kindness rather than from a place of hate. There's so much hurt in our world right now. And we all are hurting. And we're all mourning loss. Every, every person on this planet has lost something. We've either lost loved ones and friends. I lost my mom to COVID in, uh, right at the, at the end of the year. So we've, we've all lost. And, and if people haven't lost loved ones or friends, we have lost a way of life. So there's something we are all in mourning whether we recognize it or not. And if we don't have the tools to address that mourning, what happens is our deep hurt is expressed as hate. And you're seeing that hate in the world today. And so this comes back to the beginning of this conversation. What science is telling us, well, first of all, I'm just gonna stop. Uh, I, I wanna talk a little bit more about the science of the heart, but mm -hmm. I, I'm, I wanna take a breather and, and ask what I just said, does that make sense? 100%. Yeah, and I love talking about the science of the heart. My my girlfriend's actually getting her heart math certification right now. She's in the middle of it. And I know you're you're really big with heart math, and um, and it's it's. I, I would love to talk to you about that because that's one thing that I've been working on a lot for me recently over the past probably seven eight years is try to stop thinking as much and try to start feeling into something and saying how does my body feel about what's going on versus what do I think? Because thinking usually I immediately go to fear, but if I go back to my heart, I'm like. If I take a breath, how do I feel about what should happen? And so I'd love to dive into that with you, especially with what's going on right now. This is where the, the science is on our side. The science supports everything I'm, I'm about to say here. Because what in 1991, peer-reviewed scientific journals revealed a discovery that just rocked the world, the, the medical world, and especially the cardiac world, 
because they revealed the discovery of, uh, of specialized cells in the human heart, roughly 40,000 or so uh, of these specialized cells are called sensory neurites. They're essentially brain cells, but they're not in the, in the cranial brain. They're in the heart and they are arranged in a way in the heart that creates a neural network independent of the neural network in the brain. Now, what that means is that the heart has the ability to think independently of the brain, to feel, to remember, uh, to respond independently of the brain. So every time we have an experience, whether it's my Jefferson Airplane concert back in the, in the 60s or it's COVID-19 and the loss of my mom, I'm experiencing in two different places. I'm, I'm having a, my, my cranial brain experience, but I'm having my heart experience. If they're good experiences, no problem. But when we have trauma and we experience deep hurt and we're trying to heal that hurt, if we address it only through the mind and the memory and the way that we think, that can help. But often people feel like it's incomplete, something is missing. And if they feel that way, the, the reason may be because they've only addressed a portion of the hurt and a portion of the memory. Uh, what about these neurons in, in the heart? So this is where the practices come in because we all know that the brain is a polarity organ. We've got left and right brain and the brain works that way. So when you try to solve your problem or heal your hurt, uh, someone betrayed you in a, in the most intimate relationship. I mean, this is the, the deep hurt and the common one we all have. Someone in uh, close to us lies to us. And that's a deep betrayal in, in our most intimate relationships. If you try to heal that through your mind, what your left and right brain, the polarities are, polarities are always going to see a right and a wrong, good and a bad, success, failure, worthy, not worthy, uh, because that's what the brain does. That's what the logic and the ego does. It does it really well. But sometimes we want that. But if you're going to successfully heal the deep hurts of life, when you begin to move into the heart, the heart is not a polarity organ. So the heart, you don't have a left heart and right heart. And your heart doesn't see, it doesn't judge. And this is, I'm gonna make an important distinction here. The heart does not judge right, wrong, good, bad, success, failure. The heart may discern. And what that means is your heart can recognize what's true for you in your relationships with the world and other people, but your heart will never judge those things. That's the mind that does the judgment. This is why healing, rapid, complete healing, is so much more available if we approach it from the heart and the neural network and the intelligence of the heart rather than trying to think our way through it. Our ancestors knew this and, you know, from shamans, I've studied with the shamans in, in the Yucatan and the Maya and the high in, in the Andes of southern Peru and the monks and the nuns and the abbots and the monasteries in Tibet and India and Nepal and the sadhus and the yogis the gurus and all through our backyard here, the American Desert Southwest, and, and they're all very different. And the, the universal thread that ties those traditions together is the role of the heart in completing their story, their understanding of their relationship with their bodies and with the world around them. Because when you bring your heart into the picture, there is a completion, uh, you become less vulnerable, uh, you become less fearful. You feel more empowered because you have this relationship with your own biology and your own psychology. And what that does, it doesn't change what happens in the world around us, but it changes how we feel about what happens and it empowers us. And, and this is the beauty of what I was going to say. <clears throat> when you view the 1% and the 99%, or black against white, or Christian against Muslim, or whatever it is, if you view it from the heart, you're not gonna have those polarities. So you're more objective. Uh, I used to use these techniques in a, I was the youngest in the corporate boardroom at Cisco Systems. I was, um, I was the first technical operations manager at Cisco Systems. At that time, they were in Palo Alto, California. Now they're in, in San Jose. 
And, uh, and I, would, I would bring in an idea, and my idea would be criticized. And if I perceive that criticism through my ego, I would have a tendency to react and possibly say and do things I was sorry for. And that, that happens. How many of us have gotten an email that triggered us? You fire off another email, you hit send, and the minute you hit that send, you say, damn, I wish I hadn't have done that. Right. But, but through the heart, doesn't change what happens. It makes us more objective because we're not seeing the good and the bad, the right and the wrong, success, failure, worthy, not worthy, you know, all those kinds of things. And that's a powerful place to be uh, because it, it allows us to express honestly and objectively what we're feeling rather than coming from the victim in those in those other you know compartmentalized experiences mm -hmm. it this is science and it's based upon deep spiritual principles ancient traditions that now is being borne out in the laboratory as as new scanners are, are allowing us to you know the arrogance uh, of the scientific community that i am a part of uh has believed that we know everything there is to know about the human body you know they say we've come so far you know we pretty much got it dialed in or we got it nailed they found these neurons only in 1991 they published it in 94 it took them from 91 to 94 to to really confirm it was there but even now when i was in school and if you've got kids in school right now whoever's listening your kids are being taught that neurons whatever neurons you have in your brain you have when you come into this world that it's a fixed number and every time you drink a glass of wine or drink a beer, you're going to lose some. <laughs> That's the leverage of parents, you know, for all time. Yeah. New neurons from a very specific part of our brain until the last breath that we mm. take on this earth. We are constantly producing new neurons and there are epigenetic factors, lifestyle factors that we can choose to uh, like diet, like exercise, like breath, like focus, like relieving of stress and things like that, uh, and specific nutrients uh, and supplements that will support that process. Uh, stem cells, a new class. We were told when I was in school that by the time you reach my age, your stem cells are so sparse that they're probably not going to help you very much. And now we know there is an entire new class of stem cells uh, some of them, some people are calling them Genesis stem cells that are with us until our last breath with a full complement. They can become, they can actually become other stem cells wherever we need those. It's not that they aren't there. We have, we access them in a different way. And as we learn it through epigenetic factors, and as we learn to access those stem cells, it changes the way we think about healing, regeneration rejuvenation and longevity so the arrogance of science thinking they already know everything there is to know is giving way to new discoveries that are changing our story and empowering us with a very very different way of thinking about ourselves and it's all happening now when the world is changing and we need this new story love that well, I know we've only got a couple more minutes left together. I, I don't know. Did our time go by very quickly? Well, oh, it did. Fast. Okay. <laughs> we, we only got a few minutes. I feel like that was 10 minutes of us talking. We went through it quick. But with all, with all that we've covered, the science, the ancient wisdom, all of that stuff, and all the stuff that's happening in the world right now, from your side, I mean, what do you recommend after all the stuff you've, you've taught so far that people do with all the stuff that's going on right now in the world? Well, first of all, I want to say I've never been more optimistic about the world in general and because now we know what works and what doesn't and and it takes one generation to to be in the place where we are right now so I, I want to invite our viewers and our listeners to consider what a powerful being it takes to be where we are right now it takes a very powerful being to live in a world that is buckling and collapsing under the weight of not being sustainable in the presence of the change. You know, we, we were living the way we were living and it was working in that world. That world just changed. And now the way that we've been taught to think and live, the places where it's unsustainable, that is what's breaking. So it takes a very powerful being to live in a generation 
where that change is happening. The old world is falling away, but the new world is not quite in place. And we're in between. It takes a powerful being to be here and not get lost in the fear of the uncertainty. And I think the thing for me that seems to be what's up for all of us right now, uh, we don't know what's going to happen down the road. And I wouldn't even try to predict what's going to happen because we're creating it right now. If we can embrace the deep truth of the human story, the new human story that's emerging, who we are and the, the potential, this extraordinary potential lives within us, number one, that is, that is a technique. To change your thinking changes the chemistry in your body. It changes your resilience to, to life. So it's not a passive act. It is perhaps one of the most radical acts that any human may ever embrace is to accept the ability and the power to think for yourself and to base your new thinking upon what the best science of the modern world is telling us about ourselves. So that's number one. Number two, we don't know what world is going to emerge. But I know this, we must come together as a society, as a, as a global family, and identify the values that we cherish as a family, as a community, as a society, as nations, as a planet. We've got to identify these fundamental values, values like freedom and creativity and imagination and life and so many more, and bring these values front and center so that they become the foundation of every policy that is enacted, of every law that's passed, of every everything that we choose in this emerging world. And if we build, if we allow these values to be the foundation as we move forward, we cannot go wrong. It's when we compromise those values in exchange for a, an economy or for business or for you know, the dollar or whatever you want to call it. So we compromise those values. This is where we find uh, the, the problems. So these are the two things, Rob, I, I think is to embrace the deep truth uh, of our own existence, number one, and to become conscious and identify the values that we cherish so that they can be preserved as the technology is being brought into our lives on deeper and deeper levels. And as more and more ideas emerge about how we control our global society. And I'm not saying it's right, wrong, good or bad. It, if it benefits everyone, it could be a good thing if our values, our most cherished values are honored. And it's when we discount those, we, in the past, history tells us that's where we get into trouble. Mm, I love so that. Uh, the, be the bottom line, the better we know ourselves, the better equipped we are for whatever life brings to our doorstep. And I think that's what this conversation is all about. I love that. I feel like we could go for another hour with all this stuff. But Greg, where uh, where could everybody find you out on the internet? I am on the internet because I'm not in physical events very much right now. <laughs> so uh, our, our website, gregbraden.com. It's Greg with two G's, G-R-E-G-G-B-R-A-D-E-N.com. Uh, and that will tell you about our, our physical events that we have planned and a lot of resources out there as well. Thanks. Right. Hey, Rob, I, this first time we worked together, I want to let you know how much I appreciate the invitation, yeah. uh, how much I appreciate your trust in me with your community, because some of them uh, have probably never been with me before. And uh, I'm going to send my love to this big, beautiful community. And um, wow, what a juicy time to be alive. I'm, I can't I wait for our next. I look forward to our next. Yes, I appreciate you, man. Thanks for being here. All right. Thanks so much. Take good care. All right. Have a good one. You too. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. If you want to learn even more about mastering your mind, click right here and watch this video as well. What if I told you that in 10 years, 10 years from today, you will have a life that you absolutely love, like the perfect life. Would that excite you?